It's my pleasure to have uh, Ankur Moitra here uh, for today's talk. Ankur is one of the really bright young stars in uh, machine learning and theory. He works at the confluence of the two. He did his uh, uh, graduate degree at uh, PhD at MIT, and he uh, had, did a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and now he's come back to MIT as a faculty member, and it's uh, great to have you here. All right, great. Uh, thanks for coming. So today I'll be talking about new algorithms for non-negative matrix factorization and beyond. So let me start off by introducing the area in machine learning that I'm going to focus on for much of this talk. It's an area called topic modeling that's become enormously popular over the last decade or so. It's an area which hardly needs an introduction, but uh, I'm going to introduce it anyways. So, you know, what's the motivation for topic modeling is just the same story that we're flooded with information. And we'd like to be able to try and navigate these massive collections of data better. We'd like to try and develop tools to help us automatically comprehend this data. So this slide, I'm going to be a little bit more informal, and then I'll be more formal later. But, um, you know, roughly, the goal is, you know, say you have a gigantic collection of articles. Can we find some hidden structure in this collection in the form of topics that underlie the collection that occur over and over again? And if so, there are actually a number of things we could do with this. So this is an area that's been pioneered by people like Dave Bly and others. But now, what could you do if you could find these hidden topics and say, you know, collection of New York Times articles? is you could use it, for example, to annotate articles. You could highlight which paragraphs in the article are about which topics. And in this way, you could help a reader cut to the chase to figure out what parts of the article they're most interested in reading. You could also organize the topics into a hierarchy that represents their relationships and give a better summary of what topics are in this collection and how are they related, what's going on. You can even do. Uh, exploratory data analysis with these types of things. So think about an area like physics, where there are periodically fads that grow in popularity and decay. And by measuring how often these topics occur in a collection over time, they can actually pinpoint when and to what extent this happened. So this is by no means a comprehensive history, you know, uh, study of what all you can do with topic modeling. Instead, the focus of this talk is on new algorithms for these problems. So let me be a little bit more precise about what I mean by a topic. So uh, here's a New York Times article. It's a long article, but I've taken out just three fairly representative paragraphs. And I'll use this as an example to explain topic modeling. So this article, as you might guess from reading the title, is mostly about personal finance. There are words and phrases that occur in this article that you intuitively associate with the topic personal finance, things like money, risk, and retire. But this is a very good example uh, to, to build a model from is, you know, this article is not about just one topic. Instead, there's also an element of this article that's about politics. So there are words and phrases that we intuitively associate with the topic politics. So actually, throughout this talk, I'm going to think about topics as being themselves distributions on words. These are words that you're likely to use when writing an article about the given topic. So here, personal finance is associated with this distribution on words, and similarly for politics. So now this leads to a very natural model for what we might believe is the underlying structure for a collection of documents. We might believe that every document is somehow described as a distribution on topics. So like this particular example could be 70% personal finance and 30% politics. And in turn, each topic is itself a distribution on words. So this is a very basic and fundamental model in machine learning. It has applications not just to things like text analysis and topic modeling. It's also applicable in things like recommendation systems or automated diagnosis and so on. But apart from being a very natural model, this two-level probabilistic model, what I claim is what we're really faced with is an algorithmic problem. Given a massive collection of articles, how can we find these underlying topics that pervade the collection? So this is what I'll be talking about uh, today, is trying to understand, are there efficient algorithms to find these topics? And I want to clarify something. So you know, topic modeling is a really vibrant field. So there are plenty of things which work really well in practice that people know and love and really do use. But I'm a theorist. What I want to focus on are algorithms with provable guarantees. 
Now, the trouble with many of the approaches which are actually used in practice is that we don't know that they actually find the underlying topics if it really did come from such a model, or we don't know bounds on their running time to say that they always run in some reasonable amount of time. So by having a lack of provable algorithms, we're forced to settle with many algorithms which sometimes work and sometimes don't. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to revisit some of these questions and ask, are there new provable algorithms and can they do even better? So this talk is really gonna be two parts. So the first part is gonna be an optimization perspective, how to find topics by formulating the right optimization problem. This will let me introduce what's called the non-negative matrix factorization problem. It's a very well-studied problem, has many different applications. And it's a good example of you know, this type of problem. It's a good example of something that's been abstracted from machine learning, which it's computationally hard in the worst case. So you know, what can we do when we're faced with an optimization problem we'd like to solve, but it's hard? Well, in fact, I'm gonna introduce a new model, which I'll argue is really the right model, I think, in the context of topic modeling which will allow me to be less pessimistic and I'll be able to give you new algorithms for this problem, new algorithms for NMF based on separability. And in turn, in the second part in this talk, I'll return to this Bayesian perspective where we'll go back to things like topic modeling, latent Dirichlet allocation and so on. And we're going to use these algorithms for NMF to give algorithms for topic modeling with provable guarantees. And then I'm gonna show you some experimental results that these algorithms are not just very theoretically appealing, but they actually beat the state of the art in very surprising ways. So this is the outline. So let me you know, introduce this optimization perspective and be even more concrete. So when given some massive collection of articles, usually the first step is to create a very large, very sparse matrix called the word by document matrix. And this matrix is exactly what it sounds like. It's a matrix where every row represents a different word that occurs somewhere in the collection and every column represents a different document. And the entry in row i column j will just be the relative frequency of word i in document j. What I mean by relative, this will just be a normalization to make the definitions and the statements more simple, is let's think about this matrix as being normalized so it's columns sum to one. Or to put it another way, throughout this talk, I'm going to think about each document as being described by a distribution on words, just to make matters simple. So this is a very large, very sparse matrix. Many approaches in machine learning do something to this matrix to find hidden structure. What does NMF do? So NMF asks to take this entry-wise non-negative matrix M and to write it either exactly or approximately as the product of two other matrices, A and W. And our goal is to try and minimize the inner dimension, so the number of columns in A or equivalently the number of rows. But the catch in all of this, this should sound like a standard rank decomposition given a matrix write it as the product of a tall, skinny matrix and a fat, short matrix. But the catch in all of this is that we require that the matrices A and W also be entry-wise non-negative. Now the reason for doing this is that empirically when you force these matrices to be entry-wise non-negative, it actually leads to factors which are easier to interpret and think about as topics and think about as structure you're finding. So let me be a little bit more precise because actually if we interpret this factorization in the right way, we can see how it finds the topics. So it turns out that it's easy to take any such factorization and assume without loss of generality that because the columns of M sum to one, because each document is a distribution on words, that it turns out we can also assume without loss of generality that the columns of A and the columns of W also sum to one. I won't go into that, but it's, it's not hard to see. And now the point is that, you know, if each column in A is itself sums to one, is a distribution on words, then these are our topics. We hope that this factorization, the columns it finds, contains distributions like, you know, personal finance with this distribution on words. So we hope that it finds some underlying structure that occurs over and over again. So that's the first part of the interpretation. And the second part is that, Actually, since the columns of W also sum to one, we can think about this as our representation. So we can think about it as a way of expressing each document as a convex combination of the topics. Or to put it more precisely, this is really a crucial definition to make sure that we're on the same page. If I take this document, this first column, it's a distribution on words. And what I found now 
is I found that I can express this document as that convex combination of topics. So this is what non-negative matrix factorization is trying to do, is it's trying to take a massive collection of articles and create this bottleneck that you want to explain the entire collection using a very small number of shared topics. That's the idea. So non-negative matrix factorization actually has a really rich history. So this will only be an abridged history. Uh, it has the curious distinction of being independently introduced in at least, uh, uh, at least three times. I think there are even three different decades, but let's see. So let me go in reverse chronological order, ah, off by one year. Uh, you know, the, the one that I'll focus on are applications and things like machine learning. So this was introduced by Lee and Sung as uh, it was actually applied to image segmentation. But the way that it's applied throughout machine learning is usually the same. Is it's applied to a massive collection of observed variables as a way to extract some latent structure that helps you do things better. So you can either do it to a collection of documents to find these topics. You could instead apply it to a matrix of which users have purchased which items as a way to do better recommendation systems. And it also has applications in uh, automated diagnoses and so on. In fact, it was introduced uh, almost 10 years earlier by Mahalis Yanakakis in the context of proving lower bounds against linear programs. So he actually uh, introduced this concept because it governed whether or not there are small LPs for simple to describe combinatorial polytopes. In fact, it's even related to those of you who know the log rank conjecture. Uh, probably the most famous open question in communication complexity is just the question about what's the relationship between the rank and non-negative rank of Boolean matrices, and it's still open. But in fact, this wasn't even the first place it was introduced. You have to dig further back in where, into a literature called chemometrics, where it was actually called self-modeling curve resolution. So the intuition behind physical modeling, these other suite of applications, is that in some cases you observe some physical properties of a system that for a priori reasons you know that the components that compose the system interact only additively. So when you're trying to explain some observed data without using cancellations, you're again back in non-negative matrix fact factorization land. So anyways, this is my abridged history, but let me tell you a little bit more about you know, what do people do in practice? Oh, it's clearly a useful problem. Well, uh, this is a fairly representative problem for what happens all the time is that you know, this problem, well, many of the popular approaches are heuristic in nature. So one approach is local search or alternating minimization is that this problem we're faced with is non-convex. So you can try and you know, instead guess A, and then if A is fixed, computing the best W is a convex optimization problem. So then you can treat W as fixed and find the best A and alternate back and forth. And these types of methods make progress until they reach a local optimum. So really the trouble is that these types of heuristics, they work sometimes, they don't work other times, depends a lot on the initialization, and they certainly don't work on worst case inputs. In fact, there are even more serious issues. A lot of these approaches are very sensitive to details of how exactly you implement them. So what cost function do you use to measure closeness? How good A and W is compared to M? Or what's your update procedure? Or whether or not you regularize? So this is very unnerving because it says that the topics you find in a collection of articles could change if I instead cut the articles in half. I could find a very different set of topics if I take a random half of the articles instead of looking at the whole collection. So instead, uh, what I'm going to be focused on is um, do we have to settle for approaches which don't have provable guarantees, or can we instead hope for more from our algorithms? So the, the most uh, optimistic goal would be maybe there's an efficient algorithm that works on all inputs. And so this gives rise to the question, what's the worst case complexity of NMF? And actually, if you've spent enough time thinking about algorithms and machine learning, then the answer won't surprise you, it's NP-hard. In fact, this is almost always the case, that whenever we're given an optimization problem, which if we could solve would have all sorts of applications, well, the truth is it's computationally hard. So this leaves theorists being very pessimistic that all of these problems that people actually do solve in practice and are important, we tell them they can't solve them. 
Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so it's not, so the question is, is the solution unique? So the solution is not necessarily unique. Let me address that question later because uh, when I move to beyond worst case analysis, that's a very good question. Let me focus for now on a different uh, line of attack on this, which is on the upper bound side, actually by uh, connecting NMF to things about solving systems of polynomial equations, you can get an exponential time algorithm, one that's exponential in N, M, and R. But even this, I claim, you know, my goal is to not settle for these worst case results at face value. So maybe the first way we should chip away at this question is, if you think about it, the most interesting cases of NMF are precisely when the number of topics you're looking for is much smaller than the number of documents. It's not so useful if I take 300,000 New York Times articles and tell you there's 150,000 topics. So maybe even here we should ask a more refined question. Instead of is this problem NP hard for arbitrary values of R, we should instead ask what's the complexity of NMF as a function of the number of topics you're looking for? This is the first cut at trying to chip away at this question. And uh, in joint work with Sanjeev Arora, Rangji, and Ravi Kanan, we showed almost matching upper and lower bounds. So actually it turns out that you can get an algorithm which runs in time n times m to the r squared. So actually for very small values of r, this is an exponential improvement over the existing algorithms. And yet the bad news is that this is about the best you can do. That in fact, if you had an algorithm that ran in time n times m to the little o of r, then it would actually yield a sub-exponential time algorithm for three sets. Uh, this is an interesting topic. I'm not going to be talking about it today. It's actually based on uh, essentially taking systems of polynomial equations and reducing the number of variables. Uh, but this gives us an answer to this question. What's the best we can hope for, even parameterized by R? All we can hope for are good algorithms when R is very, very small. So maybe let's go back to the drawing board. Instead, we should be willing to change the model. So instead, you know, the focus of this talk is not on what makes these problems so hard, but maybe instead we should ask what makes them so easy? So what makes the instances that people actually want to solve in practice avoid all these hard gadgets that we can cook up, ways to encode 3SAT and factoring and so on? So I can tell you really quickly what the main point of this talk is, I'll say it informally, is that I'm gonna give you a natural condition on NMF, which I think is the right condition for topic modeling. This simple condition will yield a very simple algorithm that has provable guarantees. It really does work under this condition. And in fact, it runs very quickly. It runs in roughly quadratic time. This algorithm is something you actually do want to run, and it'll produce even better empirical results and beat state-of-the-art topic modeling toolkits. So that's informally the result. So let me tell you about this uh, condition which is called separability. So it was actually introduced by Donahoe and Stodden in the machine learning community. Now to answer your question, actually, when this was introduced, it was introduced for the purpose of understanding when is NMF unique. So in general, trying to figure out what are the right conditions on the input when you can hope for better algorithms, I think uniqueness and robustness are exactly the right indicators to show you you're on the right track for avoiding hard instances. So actually, it turns out that this condition, which I'm gonna describe now, will lead to algorithms that will be able to give provable algorithms under this condition. So there's a related notion called anchor words. I'll use that first, and I'll define it and use it to define separability. But let me take our topic matrix. So its columns are the topics, and its rows are the words. And throughout this talk, I'm going to use white squares to denote the zero entries, and black and colored squares to denote non-zeros. All I'm doing is I'm taking the uh, topic matrix and depicting its zero non-zero pattern. Separability will just be a combinatorial condition on this matrix. So in fact, let me define an anchor word informally. So an anchor word is one which, when it occurs, it's a very strong indicator for a topic. That does not mean every time the topic happens that anchor word occurs, but just when that anchor word does occur, it's a it's a trap door to understanding that topic. So let me give you an example. So take something like personal finance. So there are words that you're likely to use in writing an article about personal finance, things like money, risk, retire. Now the trouble is that these words are shared with other topics and they occur in other contexts. But what about a word like 401k? 
Now, it may be that 99% of the articles about personal finance don't contain this word. But if an article contains the word 401k, it's a very strong indicator for that article at least partially being about personal finance. So that's the notion of an anchor word. It's just a combinatorial condition here that in this row corresponding to the anchor word, there's only one non-zero entry, and it corresponds to the column that it's an anchor word for. So this notion of anchor words, you know, we don't really need that all the other entries are zero. You just need that there's one very significant entry. So it's good enough if an anchor word is a very strong but not perfect indicator. But let me table that issue, and let me focus on the exact case, just for simplicity, to show you how the algorithms work. So let's you know, continue this thought experiment. So I'm a big baseball fan. So what about uh, the topic baseball? So you know, there are words you're likely to use, like home run and pitcher. But again, those have other meanings and other uses. They get used in business, or you know, pitcher could be a um, you know, pitcher of some drink. But what about a technical word, like bunt? So this is, again, a word that's specific not just to sports, but to baseball in general. And before anyone tries to correct me, bunt cake is spelled with a D. So that's, you haven't got me. There was one time I was giving this talk and someone really did get me. Uh, they told me B-U-N-T is actually a type of bird, which is true. So then I told him about the notion of an approximate anchor word, that you don't need that it's zero everywhere else, just that it usually has one meaning. And he was happy, but I learned something new that day. In fact, uh, you can even use, you know, anchor words become even more likely when instead of thinking about the unit as being a word, you think about it as a phrase. Phrases are even better strong indicators. So, for example, if you use strong NLP techniques to figure out what are meaningful phrases, these act even better as anchor words. So this is the notion of an anchor word, and separability now is just that every topic has some unknown anchor word. We don't know what these are. In fact, I can tell you that from running uh, algorithms, sometimes they really surprise you what are good anchor words for topics. But these are unknown. But just the fact that they're out there is going to make this problem from NP hard and fixed parameter intractable down to solvable in a very reasonable amount of time. So you can think about it as some sort of trap door to trying to do the learning problem. That you know, if you knew these anchor words, it would really give you the key to figuring out what these topics are. So let me tell you about the main results. So the main result, the first one, uh, for the first part of this talk, is that, well, how much easier does it make it? It turns out that when the topic matrix is separable, there's a, think of R as being some large but still constant, a couple hundred is reasonable. It's a quadratic time algorithm for solving NMF. So forget N times M to the R squared or you know, all these other fixed parameter tractable results. You have an algorithm which you actually do want to run once you have this condition. So finding the right assumptions, I think, can really change whether we as theorists are so pessimistic about these problems or not. The second part of this talk is about a Bayesian perspective instead. So think about NMF. NMF is really a very, very idealized case of topic modeling. Because you're assuming that for every document, you know perfectly what its distribution on words are. But what if instead each document is characterized by a distribution on words, but the words you actually observe are only random samples from it? Now the trouble is that then you're getting a very sparse approximation to what its distribution really is. So you can ask, you know, this is the setting of topic modeling, where actually we think of our data as being stochastically generated. I'll define all of that later. But it turns out that once you have this algorithm for NMF, a clever way to use it will actually give an algorithm for topic modeling that has provable guarantees, that really does learn the underlying topics, even in the presence of this very sparse and incomplete data. And what I want to point out is that topic modeling is a huge area. So there are, I don't know, 10,000 citations of one of the first papers of this. And there are many different choices for how exactly to choose the distributions that generate these observations. But what's nice is once you have separability, it turns out that this algorithm will work for all of them. So I'll tell you more about that later. And in fact, at the very end, I'll tell you an experiment that I think should hopefully convince you. Let me just tell you for right now that our algorithm is uh, 50 to 100 times faster than things like Gibbs sampling, and yet produces just as accurate results. 
Uh, and I'll mention also there's some really beautiful work of Anand Kumar and others uh, based on tensor spectral methods. So I won't really talk about that. That's genuine, it's uh, sort of incomparable. You don't need this anchor word assumption, but it only works for one particular topic model, LDA. There's also some uh, very interesting work of Rabani et al. that I also won't cover. But let me get to the meat of the talk. So, you know, what I should uh, tell you is how do anchor words help? So I'm claiming that finding this right assumption, this thing which, you know, people came to by trying to understand when is NMF unique and when is it robust, well, this is going to save the day. So actually, once you see this algorithm, it'll be completely obvious in hindsight. So how do anchor words help? So let's take our separable topic matrix A, which I've denoted the anchor words as these green squares. Now, I don't know what they are. But what I claim is what makes this problem much easier is that part of our factorization will be hiding in plain sight. So we don't anymore have these algebraic problems of trying to recover the underlying parameters of this factorization from some polynomial functions of the data. But instead, if you think about the second row of A, all it does when you multiply it by W is it picks out the second row of W, scales it, and puts it in the matrix. So that's the point, is that in this idealized setting of NMF, what's happening here is that actually the rows of W are appearing in M as scaled copies. This will not be the case when we move to the stochastic setting, but this is the idealized case right here. So now, you know, what we should really focus on instead is, you know, we have this observation that if A is separable, part of our factorization is in front of us. We just need to find out where. But we should instead focus on is how can we find these anchor words? So I claim this is actually equally easy, is that what we need is we need the right geometric characterization of what an anchor word is. This will give us a reinterpretation of what this condition means. So think about the rows of M now. And you know, we can normalize them so that they each sum to one. So I'm changing the normalization on you, but you can ignore normalizations if you want. Now, what if I take all of these rows in M and I plot them? I just plot them as points. I claim, actually, what our picture looks like is very simple, is that it's a simplex where the vertices are the anchor rows. That's because any non-anchor row, say the first row of M, by virtue of it not being an anchor row, it actually can be expressed as a convex combination of the other anchor rows. So what this means then is that the anchor rows are the extreme points. They're the words which when, you, when we understand how they occur in different documents, we understand how all the other words do too. So now if we think about what happens to our picture when we delete a row in M, if we accidentally delete an anchor row, then what happens to our geometric picture is that we've deleted one of the vertices. So we've strictly changed the convex hull. But in contrast, what happens when we delete a row that's not an anchor word? Actually, we don't change the convex hull. So that's the geometric condition which is going to allow us to identify the anchor words and in turn solve separable NMF is that deleting a word changes the convex hull if and only if it's an anchor word. So now there's a very simple polynomial time algorithm. This is not the algorithm you would actually want to run, but let me first convince you that it's polynomial time. Is now you can find these anchor words, which are extreme points, just by linear programming. Because all you do is when you consider deleting some point, some row, you ask, can it be expressed as a convex combination of the remaining rows? If it can, then deleting it doesn't change the convex hull. But if it can't, then it does. So what's the full algorithm now for separable NMF? All we do is we can find the anchor words. Let's say for now it's by linear programming. That's a really bad idea in general. But you know, for each anchor word, we use a linear program to figure out whether each potential word, we figure out is it an anchor word or not. Once we have those anchor words, we take out those rows in M and we paste them in as rows in W. And now one of the factors in our factorization is known. So we can actually just ask, what's the non-negative A so that A times W is as close as possible to M? So this is an algorithm with provable guarantees now that really does find the non-negative matrix factorization if there's a separable topic matrix. And in fact, what I claim is you can actually get around running one linear program for every word. That would be pretty bad. Uh, instead, you can find the vertices of this convex hull greedily, for example. 
you know, one of the approaches we tried, there are many approaches people have developed for this since our original paper, but you can start with a random point inside the simplex, find the furthest point from that. That will be a vertex of the simplex. Once you've found that vertex, finding the furthest point will again be another vertex. Then when you have two vertices, you can connect them with a line and ask for the furthest point from that line. That'll be another vertex. So there are simple greedy algorithms that work well. In fact, those greedy algorithms only work with pairwise distances between points. You can even dimension reduce the data before you do that. So these algorithms really are something that's very quick to do. And then this last step of computing this non-negative A is convex programming, but in very small dimension, in R dimensions. One for each uh, row of A. So that's the algorithm provable guarantees for NMF. And now let me tell you about part two, how actually this simple algorithm applied in the right way will give us algorithms for all topic models at once, once you have separability. So you know, what is topic modeling? Topic modeling is a very related sounding problem. So you know, we again have two matrices A and W, which are entry-wise non-negative. But now there'll be two differences. So the first difference is that W is no longer fixed. It's stochastic. There's some distribution that generates its columns. So for example, this distribution might say that the first document is entirely about personal finance and we get this column in W. And then we multiply it by A and we get this column in M. Or maybe the distribution would, the next document you sample would be half baseball, half movie reviews, something like Field of Dreams. And it would give us the second column in M. So that's the first difference, is just that W now, we're thinking of it as being a stochastic matrix instead of a fixed one. That's not a big deal. What, a big deal. what the big deal is, is that we don't have access to M. So each column in M is a distribution on words. Each document is described by distribution on words, but each document is quite short. So we don't know what its underlying distribution really is. Instead, all we get are random samples from it. So let me state an extreme version of this just to make my point. What if in each of these documents, it's only a few words long? So each column in our observed word by document matrix is extremely sparse. It only has a small number of non-zeros. You can think about it as, you know, if you're running this on a collection of NIPS abstracts, they would be very short documents. So really the trouble is that when we don't have access to M, but a very, very crude approximation to it, M hat, can we still learn the topic matrix? And the trouble is that M hat is not even close to M. If you take a typical column, one in M could be dense and the other one in M hat is sparse. So they're not at all close in, in any reasonable distance. Now I want to emphasize that actually this entire field of topic modeling, or most of it anyways, is really just varying how the, how, uh, the distribute, what the distribution is that generates the columns of W. So for example, uh, you know, one of the foundational papers here was Bly, Ng, and Jordan, which uh, they used the, uh, a Dirichlet distribution to generate the columns of W. It's a distribution which I'm not gonna define, but it's something that favors relatively sparse vectors. So it corresponds to our intuition that each document should be a combination of at most a few different topics. So that's one particular distribution you might plug in for W. Then there are much fancier ones too. Like for example, you could observe that uh, certain pairs of topics are very positively correlated and some other pairs of topics never occur together. And so this gave rise to things like correlated topic models, the correlated topic models of Bly and Lafferty. There are even fancier ones where you have things like the Pachinko allocation model where there's some hierarchy of topics which is then used to generate the distribution. So each one of these is a further refinement. So there are you know, hundreds of different possible topic models, choices for how you believe W might be generated for real collections. But they all differ in this very controlled way. They only differ in how the columns of W are generated. And what I'm gonna tell you is that actually once you assume separability, you can give an algorithm for learning all of these topic models at once. So it won't matter whether you think the world is LDA or Pachinko allocation model or some stranger model yet to be invented, the algorithms will still work. So you know, how can we use our algorithms for NMF for this Bayesian setting? So you know, the real issue that I want you to keep in mind, just to refocus here, 
is that the real issue we're worrying about is what if documents are really short? Let me say something extreme. Let's pretend documents were only two words long. So the issue is that each document we see, we only get a small number of words. We learn very little about what topics actually describe that document, and then we move on to the next document, and we never see that document again. So the issue is that all we have in our power here is we can take more and more documents. So we're growing out this matrix M hat, but it's never converging to anything. So it seems at first glance difficult to figure out how can you use this matrix, which has a crazy amount of noise and sparsity. But the crucial observation is, which will make all of this work, is that actually we shouldn't be working with the word by document matrix. Instead, we should work with what's called the grand matrix. So instead, we'll use a matrix which describes how often different pairs of words co-occur. This is a matrix which will converge and will be useful enough for NMF. So <coughs> the grand matrix is very simple to describe. It's just after you know, ignoring some normalizations, it's just m hat, m hat transpose. So the important point is just a word by word matrix that describes for a different pair of words how often they're likely to co-occur in a document. And now as we increase the number of documents, we actually, this matrix is not growing. So we can estimate it to arbitrary precision and it converges to something, it converges to its expectation. And we can pull out A by linearity. And we have this inner matrix, WW transpose, which describes how often the topics co-occur with each other. Let me call that matrix R. That's uh, the fixed property of our topic model. And now, so what we're really given, we can assume, is roughly the product of A times R times A transpose. But the important point is that these last two matrices are non-negative, and the first one is separable. So again, we're back in the separable NMF setting. Actually, there's a, there's a catch, which is really important, is that the normalization of this remaining matrix is not what it was supposed to be in the separable NMF setting. So all we can actually get from applying our NMF algorithm directly is we can find the anchor words. They'll still be the extreme rows of the Gram matrix. And we're gonna have to do a little bit more work to uniquely figure out this remaining matrix because it's normalized in a very strange way. But let me tell you about this. This is an interesting way to bring a Bayesian interpretation to what it is we're doing. So let's, you know, we're, we're in this setting where we have this Gram matrix, and given enough documents, we get a good enough approximation of the Gram matrix that we can find the anchor words again. They're the extreme rows, but of the Gram matrix. And now the question is, how can we use these anchor words to find the rest of the topic matrix? And so what I claim is we should really give a reinterpretation of what it means for a word to be an anchor word. Let's instead look at the posterior distribution. So given that a word occurs and we know nothing else about that uh, document, what's the posterior distribution on which topic generated it? I claim an anchor word is, what it is, is it's a word which is supported, it's posterior is supported on just one topic, at least in the exact case. And the approximate case, it's one where the posterior is almost entirely on one topic. So it's just a word where the posterior is supported on just one topic. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the anchor words to find the rest of the posteriors. And this will come just from going back to the same geometric picture, but interpreting it in a Bayesian way now. So let's take the rows of our gram matrix. So we're working with the gram matrix now, not the word by document matrix. And again, we have to normalize it so that it's rows sum to one. But again, what's going on is that if we plot those vectors, they form a simplex. And the vertices of the simplex are the extreme points. These are the anchor words. So now think about a word which is not an anchor word. It's expressible as a convex combination of the anchor words, which means when we know how, you know, for example, this word right here, it's half anchor word two and half anchor word three, let's say for simplicity. What this tells us is that how word number three co-occurs with all the other words can be expressed as a convex combination of how anchor word two does it and how anchor word three does it. And if you work it out, what this really tells you is that what you've just found is you found the posterior distribution. How you express word number three as a convex combination of the anchor words really tells you that the posterior of which topic generated word three is the same convex combination. In this case, it's half topic two and half topic three. 
So what this means is from this geometric picture, once we find the anchor words, for every word in our collection, we can compute the posterior on what the posterior is on which topic generated that word. And what we really want is we want the probability of the word given the topic. Those are the entries in the matrix A. So all we have to do to go between these two different representations is apply Bayes' rule. That's this formula. And the important point about this formula is just that everything on this right-hand side I can compute. The probability of the topic given word prime, this comes from my geometric picture of how you express word prime as a convex combination of the anchor words. And similarly, I can compute the probability of each word just by looking at my data. So this means that everything on the right-hand side I can compute from my data, so I really can compute A, and this gives us our algorithm for topic modeling. All we do is we form the Gram matrix, and now we run NMF uh, to find, we run our algorithm for separable NMF to find the anchor words. These are the extreme rows of the Gram matrix. Once we have the anchor words, then we can express every word as a convex combination of the anchor words. That gives us for every word what its posterior is. And all we have to do is compute A from the above formula, from Bayes' rule. And you can analyze this algorithm and show that it's also stable, that if you want to learn the entries of the topic matrix within some additive epsilon, then in fact, this algorithm takes poly and n and one over epsilon samples and runs in that same amount of time and provably learns the underlying parameters of the topic model within an additive epsilon. So what we've just given is that once you have separability, not only do you get NMF, but in fact, you get an algorithm for all topic models. The only assumption that was hidden in here was just that this co-occurrence matrix of which topics co-occur with which other topics should be non-singular. That's it. And now, actually, let me tell you about an experiment that I think is going to provide a sort of different take on what's going on here. Because really, there's a scientific question I should address, which is, so that's great. You know, we have anchor words, and they make everything easy. Are there actually anchor words? So uh, let me give you an experiment, which really, so let me first tell you one thing, which I do want to remark on, is that this algorithm was very different than the first algorithm we gave for it. So what's kind of funny, and this is kind of rare, is that this algorithm was actually inspired by experiments, the one I gave you. So we had another algorithm with provable guarantees, but it was, you know, it was also based on find the anchor words, set up a system of linear equations to solve for A. But the trouble was that it relied on solving a linear system. So that algorithm, even though it had provable guarantees, it didn't use the fact that what it was looking for was non-negative or a distribution. So actually when we tried it out, it produced bad results because even though it has provable guarantees, it would require too many documents, just the polynomial and its sample complexity, to actually get good estimates. And the reason it was doing so badly was something stupid. It was getting small negative values even though what it should be looking for are necessarily non-negative. So instead, this, this, uh, this different algorithm came from talking to machine learning folks and coming up with a reinterpretation of what we're doing in terms of Bayes' rule. So it was this ability to circumvent solving linear systems through Bayes' rule, which actually changed this from not just an algorithm of provable guarantees, but one that actually does work well. So let me tell you the following experiment, which to me is the one that convinced me. Uh, so are there anchor words in the world? I don't know. Neither does anyone else. So let's do the following experiment instead. Let's take an existing topic modeling toolkit, one that people already know and use and love, and let's run it on a real collection of data. It finds you know, some, in this case we ran mallet, on a collection of uh, 1,100 NIPS abstracts, and we trained a model. Now it finds some set of uh, topics that it believes describe this collection. Now, you could look at that set of topics and see that there are words that are near anchor words. There are words whose posterior is 90% on one topic and that many topics indeed do have this. But the truth is that these near anchor words aren't so near to being anchor words that our algorithms really tell us that we should be stable to that level of deviation. But instead, let me describe a different experiment which is now you can take that underlying topic model that Mallet has learned, which it believes is a realistic topic model, and now you have a baseline truth. You can use that to generate further examples. 
And you can run our algorithm on those further examples compared to running mallet on those, on those examples again. So we're comparing how well our algorithm can find the underlying topic matrix compared to how well mallet can find its own output again. It's a very unfair comparison. And I'm not making any assumptions that the topic matrix is separable. I'm just taking whatever mallet gives me and saying that's an important topic model to learn. And actually, it learned it 50 to 100 times faster and more accurately if you're given enough data. So the running time is not interesting at all. You know, if you take mallet uses Gibbs sampling, so that's its plot of its runtime, and it's doing some MCMC things, so it just needs a lot of iterations, whereas the thing I described is just using basic linear algebraic subroutines, so of course it's very fast. But uh, in effect, look at recover L2 is the one that I actually described. Um, and in fact, if you look at its accuracy, so here we're looking at the L1 distance between the topics we found compared to the true topics because there's an underlying base. Here's mallet. It does very, very well. You can't compete with mallet with small amounts of documents because it's so well optimized, it's just very difficult to beat. But eventually, when you have enough documents, it's actually better, despite the fact that it's 50 to 100 times faster. So to put it another way, and, and just to tell you, uh, recover, so the version of our algorithm that used solving linear systems before we found this Bayes rule interpretation is this green bar. So it's really terrible. Here, this is about random guessing. So it, it's, it's getting roughly that type of error is random guessing. So this sort of reinterpretation was really the key that made the algorithm practical. But now what I'm saying is that this algorithm, recover L2, it has better error than mallet despite running much faster. So I want to make this point that um, when you're faced with intractability, you know, things like for LDA, it's NP hard to find the maximum likelihood estimator. Well, you can do one of two things. You can either try to find maximum likelihood anyways by using alternating minimization, Gibbs sampling, or other approaches where you don't know how long they take or whether they really find it. And those approaches are extremely well optimized to small amounts of data because there just aren't that many local optima you can get trapped in. But as soon as you scale up the size of the problem, the fact that it's not actually solving the underlying optimization problem exactly is more of a barrier than the fact that I'm not using, making information theoretically optimal use of the data. So another way to put it is I'm not sure we figured out what are the right algorithms to scale up in the first place because the trade-offs you get in a very small data regime between when should I use a heuristic without provable guarantees or when should I use a provable algorithm that doesn't do information theoretically optimal things is different. Yep? How did you run the infinite number of documents? Sorry, so the question was how did I run the infinite number of documents? That's a good question, so let me explain this. So we created this infinitely large matrix and no, actually what we did was uh, documents you know, we know their empirical average because we've generated the model. So we just give it the true gram matrix without any error. That's the infinite document case. Now, why does it have any, why does our algorithm provable guarantees have any error there? Is because the topic matrix is not necessarily separable. That's the error in the separability assumption. What are the errors on the error then? Uh, Right, so this is some level of our confidence on these things. Uh, sorry, what? Specifically for the infinite, if you said that it's the error of the exact. Well, so I mean, we, we ran uh, many trials of this. I mean, so there is some randomization in our algorithm, especially the implementations we have where, you know, we use some random ways to try and find the anchor words quickly. And so there is some variance in, in, in how it does. Um, and let me quickly mention that, so this is true not only if you measure the L1 distance between different documents, but even if you do things like held out log likelihood or you know, David Mimno is a co-author, so he has all sorts of fancy ways of, uh, of evaluating how good topics are. So he has coherence measures as well. And again, the same things hold. So I guess you know, what I'm trying to say, and let me tell you one other thing, is that you can also run this on real data, which actually I found very interesting as well. 
uh, is that we were actually able to run on the UCI collection, which is 300,000 New York Times articles, and we ran in 10 minutes instead of Mallet, which took 24 hours to do this. Uh, now, I, I don't know of any good uh, objective ways to try and evaluate how good the topics are. Um, but, you know, if you're interested, I can show you, and I actually think they're better again. Uh, I think my personal favorite way of doing it is if I give you the list of topics and ask you to perform the thought experiment, if I told you those words occurred in an article, would it tell you something the article is about? Then I think it performs better in that regard, at least to my eye. Because, you know, Mallet is trying to optimize for log likelihood, so it inevitably finds many more not as meaningful sets of topics. There are, you know, one topic it found was hands, ears, eyes, nose, face, mouth, which is definitely a very statistically, you know, co-occurring set of words. But if I told you those words occurred in an article, you probably wouldn't have a good idea about anything the article is about. It's usually those words don't occur in like a medical or health context. So I think these uh, topics actually tend to be more specific. I'm a big sports fan, so I was very happy to see that since this New York Times collection is a little bit dated, it actually picked up the feud between Bill Belichick and Bill Parcells. That was one of the topics in there. Uh, it even picked up like Ilian Gonzalez and other things. So let me tell you a little bit about the um, bigger picture. So I guess, uh, you know, a lot of the things I've been doing lately, especially things in this talk, are really centered around the following question. So is learning computationally easy? So it seems like time and time again, the optimization problems that we formulate from machine learning, they're hard. They're hopelessly, hopelessly hard. So is this intractability when we prove you can't do graphical models without solving sharp P problems? Is this type of hardness really a barrier to doing better in machine learning? Or are there ways around it? Now, the, some of the ways around it are, for example, defining new models. So things like NMF, maybe we could say, you know, the instances of NMF which create these hard instances are not actually very stable. So they're not actually very meaningful. And things like separability are ways to get around this instability and, and enforce robustness. It led to things like, I don't know if you can read that, but uh, led to new algorithms for non-negative matrix factorization and topic modeling. Um, I'll mention that, uh, you know, in fact, one of, the, one of the other approaches to this question is that typically uh, people are very concerned with the maximum likelihood estimator. So the maximum likelihood estimator is the one which really is you know, founded in good statistical theory, but it's the answer to the wrong question. It's the answer to the question, what should you do if you're really data limited and you don't care about computing time? Well, the information theoretically optimal estimator is the maximum likelihood estimator. It's asymptotically efficient as the nomenclature. But the trouble is, again, that it's always hard to compute. So instead, you can think about attacking this question by looking for other estimators. Maybe if you don't want to converge at the information theoretically optimal rate, are there other estimators that converge at a still reasonable rate, but now you can exactly compute and you don't need heuristics? So one you know, family of ways around this is things like the method of moments estimator. So I'll mention just in one slide for you know, learning mixtures of Gaussians, for example. Um, this problem actually goes back to this famous statistician, Carl Pearson. Uh, who has an unsavory history, but he was very interested in evolution and biology. And he uh, took many species of this crab that uh, in the surrounding region called the Naples crab. He measured some physical characteristic. He measured the ratio of the circumference of the head of the crab divided by its height. And he plotted the different frequency of occurrence of different values. And he thought for biological reasons that this type of parameter should be a Gaussian. But what he got was not a Gaussian because it wasn't even symmetric around its maximum value. So actually what he postulated was that actually maybe it was two species of Naples crab and that the distribution could be explained as a convex combination of two Gaussians. And he asked this question of can you infer the parameters of a mixture of Gaussians from random samples? And he introduced the method of moments in the study. It was rather amazing. He, um, you know, if you dig up this paper, he was solving systems of polynomial equations by hand, which you know, were systems of polynomials in six variables of degree nine and so on. And, you know, this is another example of, you know, this is the type of thing which you would run, say, EM or alternating minimization on. And, uh, you know, the, the trouble is that those types of algorithms get stuck in local optima, so they don't necessarily find the optimum. And again, maximum likelihood for this problem is NP hard. It degenerates to solving an APX hard clustering problem. 
So instead, we gave an approach which was based on the method of moments and based on connections to the systems of polynomial equations, where we gave a polynomial time algorithm for this problem. And this is in contrast to a lot of the other work in this area. This is the first polynomial time algorithm, where you know, the work starting with Dasgupta assumed that the components are very far apart, that they're clusterable, so that you can cluster them so that you know which samples came from which component. And instead, we're actually able to handle entirely in the other regime where the components are almost entirely overlapping. So I'll mention that you should also see related work of Belkin and Sinha, uh, also on the same problem that gave a polynomial time algorithm. So I guess that's about it. Let me summarize, which is, um, so really I want to make the point that uh, time and time again, these optimization problems that are handed to us because they would be great if we could solve them. We would have all sorts of applications, things like NMF. They're always hard. They're always hopelessly intractable. So maybe there should be a bit more of back and forth to figure out what the right version of the question is. Because if the answer is it's hard, then maybe there's some underlying optimization problem that makes the right assumptions that's actually computationally easy. And that by identifying what it is that actually makes these instances we really want to solve in practice so easy, we can hope to do it much better. So we can hope that these models lead to interesting new theory and actually in some cases highly practical new algorithms. So I'll, uh, I'll end there. So thanks for your attention.